Ladrack's argument would be that <coughs> to initiate a peace process or peace building conflict transformation process you need usually to initiate it in the, what he calls the intermediate level, the civil society it's not that they are the key drivers but they might be the initiators and his point is that they usually if you find the right people on that level, not everyone is suited for this but those who have the trust and relations with top leaders and grassroots levels as well across let's say that mm -hmm. there's an ethnic conflict inside that society across on a more horizontal level have trust on, on the other side so to speak then you can begin a transformation process from that level but it should involve the grassroots level as well without the grassroots it will be hard to move forward so the local turn which the United Nations and Liberal Peace and others are talking about seems to be a little bit sometimes almost a romanticizing of the grassroots levels as something that should come from below <coughs> and trickle up but Ladrack and others to speak about it should trickle out from everywhere and involving those who are the core actors to the conflict which again implies that before you do anything make a comprehensive conflict analysis and first you need to know who are really the <coughs> owners of the company, who are the core actors per se. So this interplay between the various spaces or levels, whatever concept you use, in the conflict area um, is, is of immense importance to understand. So today we will focus more on, or less, on the top leaders. We are more interested in seeing how intermediate and grassroots levels or spaces can um, initiate and start a transformation process. But it will also include the other levels. But you yourself, I always ask that, and I think those who have had me before they know that, ask from where does peace come? I don't think it's the top leaders. I don't think they are the ones who always initiate. Sometimes you have exceptions. And that's what you usually call brave leaders and so on. But, but we don't have that many of them. Most are very pragmatic, even sometimes opportunistic, and trying to sense how the mood is out there, and then from there on trying to, to push forward. We also know that from the track one negotiations, they're not that keen on elaborating all kind of win-win solutions. Rather, they are keep, keeping <coughs> understanding on their positions and interest rather than their needs. So let's see then what the other levels can do and what examples we have. Because usually you hear in the critique from those who still believe in the top leader level and peace building model that there are not good examples from, from how peace can be built from below. And I'm not saying it's not difficult, but it's definitely place where you can do a lot. Of course, if you try to identify these players more uh, accurately when we speak about the intermediate level according to Ladrack, we speak about academics, bureaucrats, religious leaders, national NGO leaders, and so on, and even academics. That's why we have been involved sometimes too. Uh, bureaucrats that could be, you know, civil servants that are very close to the top leaders, of course. But they usually may also have some good contacts and relations with the grassroots. And as you know, sometimes <coughs> one person can be running from different positions. On the one hand, being a servant to a top leader, but also be a representative within an NGO and so on. Uh, but the point is, we need to identify who are the peace capacities. Then among also intermediate level, people are still prone to go on uh, with conflicts. Uh, some of you have seen this. So one could divide the different tracks into various potential <laughs> ways of, of working with peace building. We spoke about number one and two last time in the lecture. So I will not talk so much about that. But you see that there are more tracks from three to nine. By the way, I will place the last as well as today's lectures 
PowerPoint on Google, so you will have access to it. Don't worry. In case you are desperate to making notes here. So there are three to nine, meaning six additional, or seven additional tracks, uh, where maybe there are even more. I haven't thought it through, but inspired from McDonald and Diamond, we have seven more <laughs> tracks which we could work with. Companies, some companies actually want to have a change in the cost of dynamics. I'm not speaking necessarily about arms industry. They want usually to, to have a continuation of the conflict itself. But some companies maybe are hesitant to invest in a conflict area, but would do it if there would be a peace agreement. Uh, they might be a example of how Jordan and Israel and they have a peace agreement, a joint venture, some industries. We also know that sometimes can be problems on the long run because like the Jordanian Israeli textile textile uh, company have Jordanian low salary payment. Usually women can create a lot of problems in itself. <coughs> <coughs> Close and the the distance between Jordanians and Israelis. Uh, citizen diplomacy is another example, which I will also bring up more in the future detail later. Uh, here I just mentioned, for instance, the mothers in Argentina. You have also women in Guatemala and, and women in, in uh, Colombia and so on. We've been going out on streets demonstrating and asking, requesting from the regime that they give information about their loved and dear ones, what has happened to them, and so on. In particular, mothers in Argentina, they succeeded in them, forced the regime to act, and got a lot of public support by doing these actions, which shows at the time when you had an authoritarian regime, and also in authoritarian regimes, you can have an impact uh, towards change. Uh, research and education, there are many ongoing, interesting, both research and educational corporations in conflict areas, which is one way of bringing the conflict parties directly into some sort of joint action or joint future. I will give you one example where we have been involved in, uh, in, in Jerusalem. Um, activism, track six, is probably that track which is mostly say visible in the media, in particular news media, because when something is <coughs> action, that's when the media is there. They rarely go into the other tracks that we just discussed. But activism in particular. In particular if there is some uh, confrontation between police forces or something else. Um, and there are many, many examples. I think the most recent example is from the Arab Spring, which I also will, if time allows, will talk a little bit about. And it also leads directly to the concept of resistance when there is some sort of um, regime oppression or war-like situation. What can be done in terms of, of public resistance? And actually, it's quite a relaunched, you could say, recent research field within academia. It's striking how little we have done research on what is the difference and, and in, in terms of impact of social change and peace building uh, when we compare on the one hand armed resistance with peaceful means, uh, unarmed resistance. And we'll come into that a little bit. Religious facilitators, there are so many religious quiet facilitators who mediate in various conflicts all over the world. Quaker and Mennonites in particular, but also many others. Um, <coughs> they're doing a one of them, Adam Kerr, I always mention. Also John Paul Laddock, who is a Mennonite himself. And uh, Adam Kerr, he was a Quaker. He worked with many conflicts in Africa in the quiet. Brought the conflict parties together. But then again, he worked more as a facilitator with top leaders or on the intermediate level. Um, if 
funds are always important. We need to find peace funds, also peace building costs on the real thing, <coughs> and giving much less resources to peace building compared to military campaigns, which is a little bit odd in one sense, but that's not how the world functions. But we need to identify sometimes who are those who are ready to pay for the peace investment you want to do. Another final track nine has to do with the media's role. I think a lot of research has already convinced most people on that. Media is a very good either actually contributor or even initiator of conflict escalating, escalation and also to fuel the conflicts by being very biased, particularly in ethnic conflicts we know from, for instance, the the, the breakdown of Yugoslavia and how the media reported about each other's sides. We had an us and them talk. And of course, they just created fears and stereotypes. So the idea is then to reverse this and try to see if we can have some sort of peace media reporting and see if you can report in a different way than, than usually the media does by, by explaining the conflict as being zero sum games where no side can win so one side can only win and at the expense of the other side so to speak at the cost of the other side so public opinion communication media can might be a very important part in in the local term or whatever we define it as all right anyone has another example while i was talking came up with a new track i didn't Society switch, God knows, maybe we have cyberspace tracks in, in the future, um, building relationship via internet uh, on the inside of the conflict dynamics with external actors on the grassroots level, blogs, like a, God knows what. Yes? I mean, I think during the Arab Spring, you saw, for example, online groups as anonymous who come from all over the world uh, sending out leaflets um, how to. Uh, for example, um, treat wounds, how to um, block certain punches, how to um, like not get hurt when police is uh, hitting you. Yeah. And they also sent, uh, like, they made it possible that, they, that in Tunisia the internet was not uh, shut down. Yeah. So actually there was a lot of, uh, they, they contributed a lot to the, the, the development of the conflict. Mm. I don't know to what degree that is... Uh, um, Resolution yet, but I mm. mean, if, if the whole population has internet, that is that is quite a good thing. Yeah, it's a big debate whether the Arab Spring was a uh, uh, social media revolution or not. I mean, that's but a that's thing. true that in some of the cases you had exactly what you described: uh, information and, and uh, on the one hand, on what actually what's going on in the conflict dynamics; on the other hand, and as you say, different advices and so on. So, in one sense, social media has not replaced but complemented classical old readings and newspapers and so on which then usually in an authoritarian regime is controlled by the regime so social media was a way of coming around with more balanced news or from one side news meaning from the grassroots level so that's interesting in itself it's a big deal I'll come back a little bit to, to that because it looks different from one country in the Arab world to another on how much social media plays a role or not. Yeah. yeah, so maybe we add cyber internet communication as a tenth track. track. Mm. Well, I give you some empirical inputs. Uh, some of you have been before to remember some of the cases. Uh, the first one is from a Swedish organization that worked in Somalia in around the 1990s, in the beginning. Actually, they went on to work there until, I still think they have an office there and work in there until this day, but with a much lower profile than, than compared to how it was in the day. <coughs> Somalia, as you know, recent news has shown how horrific and difficult the, the conflict dynamics are. The suicide bomb killed something like 200. Uh, it all began, the breakdown of the dictatorship around 1990 
and uh, of course linked to that there were different uh, problems inside not least authorian structure in itself when the leader takes a lot of wealth we also had um, different kind of drafts uh, starvation problems and so on it also created tension between the different parts of the country uh, so when the dictator had to go actually in the very beginning of 1991 uh, it quite soon led to some sort of internal civil war although one could say that the Somalis are more or less one nation it's still as we know that identification can shift and change when you have different clans when you have different warlords or control different areas in the country it was a disastrous situation but that was a time when the Cold War just had ended, USSR had just dissolved, and, and all of a sudden the great powers could cooperate in the United Nations, in the Security Council. So they had different ideas on how we should make peace all over the world, and that's how this whole agenda for peace also came in 1992. And also in the United Nations case, in the Somalia case, the United Nations intervened in a big peace-building operation. And in that um, context, you had uh, a telephone call coming to the office of LPI, Life and Peace Institute in Uppsala, asking whether they would like to contribute to build peace. And the idea was that they should have a division of labor where the United Nations would build the central government that had been collapsing as a result of, of um, the, the dictatorship's fall, while the civil society um, part, building peace from below, should go to the Life and Peace Institute. That's not a small mission. I mean, I thought it was a big mission to have top negotiations between Israelis and, and Gulf State, but this one, you know, really building peace from below, it's an immense work task. But they were brave enough and said, yes, we can contribute. And they really made a big effort to, to transform this. That was a time when uh, a lot of, um, I would say, second, third generation conflict resolution started to question this, where that peace cannot only come from the top, it must come from, from other sides of society too. That's also when John Paul Lederach started to develop his idea on how you should initiate and transform a conflict rather than solve an issue, which is quite important to remember. So when they were involved, <coughs> they, they tried to work according to what the conflict resolution was the first, second, and beginning of the third generation uh, recommended on how you should build the peace. And uh, they did what rarely is done in conflicts. A real comprehensive conflict analysis first. Don't do anything before you have done your conflict. And that's why we always have these kind of exercises in the beginning of these courses. You need to know something about conflict analysis. Then it can be designed and, and, and look a little bit different from one, one conflict dynamic to another on how you make this analysis. But at least you need to have some sort of clue on what are the issues, who are the core actors, what are the triggers in the conflict, what kind of attempts have been made, why did it fail, and so on, before you do anything at all. But you don't make it just yourself. Um, you also involve experts from the conflict. On the one hand, they had international experts, um, like Ladrak, he was involved, um, but also local experts from Somalia who had fled the country and could be inputs. And from there on, they, they started to come up with some sort of blueprint for how they should eventually go ahead. But they also wanted to have a an, um, uh, security or an insurance um, that it was really uh, the right kind of conflict analysis they had conducted in the conflict analysis. So it's not enough to have uh, something like 20, 40 different kind of experts looking at the company and giving their inputs. They also went to the lo local <coughs> level inside Somalia to check with the different clans and so on. What do you think about this? The local population, not the top leaders. First of all, Somalia didn't have a central government. It had collapsed. 
which again was a problem for, for the United Nations because with whom should you have contact? So then it's easier if another organization takes this grassroots responsibility. Anyway, they came <coughs> quite early on to some sort of conclusion that one of the problems with Somalia was that the warlords had too much power on the local level. So how can you try to isolate them? One way is, of course, make sure not to talk to them. <laughs> and the United Nations uh, promised in an agreement with Life and Peace that you build, we will build the central government and we will not talk with the warlords directly and how they should have a political role and negotiate and so on. Try to isolate them as much as possible while you build the peace from below. Um, in order to restore some sort of new political structure, uh, one of the suggestions from the conflict analysis was to build uh, on, on existing previous older systems like the elderly structures. So the idea was to give legitimacy to the elderly structure that had existed before, before the warlords had taken over, so to speak. Again, here came again something that has to do with the global culture and liberal peace. The Westerners, of course, wanted to also have when the elderly structure should be reinstalled, so to speak. Uh, it should be both w men and women. In the old times, you had only men in, in the power position. So that was something that came in from the West, so to speak, into the peace building idea. But basically, life and peace should build the peace from below. And decided that on this kind of peace conference, they asked the different yeah, clans or whatever you define them as coming from different parts of coming together and they don't just sit and talk for one, two, three days they had a conference for five months or something like this so they were really elaborating the whole thing and can you imagine that you from now on until March will sit together and talk about how your vision future society would look like you rarely have that type of peace conferences. But that's what they had here. So in many ways they could really have checks and balance scrutiny of, of the peace proposal, the blueprint itself. And of course some parts were redefined, redesigned, and from down then they started to build the peace gradually. Um, how do you build that the peace? Well, well the idea. Well I said already that the United Nations will work with establishing institutions on the center level. Meanwhile, they will find elderly structures on the local grassroots level as well as the regional level in Somalia. So it's about reinstalling. You can see one woman. It's just somewhere in the middle, right? <laughs> the majority are men. So that was one issue. So of course they had a different kind of um, trainings. We had all the classical things that's also part of the liberal peace package. Trainings in, in conflict resolution, trainings in human rights, training in gender equality, and so on. So in order to prepare for, for elderly structures to take over and include also the women. That was the whole idea. And they knew that there was a patriarchal strong structure in Somalia, uh, but they also made use of it. So basically by bringing the different clan women together, they could also ask them to go in between the fighting forces and to shoot at your own women is really a sin, so everyone stopped fighting some of the pockets and then they could start negotiating about local ceasefire in different areas in Somalia. And it spread out and eventually they could start to reinstall these elderly structures. And of course, it's about building a new municipality and to restore it, give it some sort of legitimacy. I don't know how much IKEA furniture uh, made money on this, but a lot of IKEA furniture came to these municipalities in order to give it nice look and, and legitimacy. And almost in all the 16 districts of Somalia, they managed to reinstall these kind of elderly structures. It was nearly a total success, uh, which is
is a quite impressive thing. And uh, the women came gradually in, still far from that even today. It's rather a continuation of this patriarchal structure. But they played a key role in, in the beginning of this peace building process. Could be part of not only the ceasefire thing, but also be part of the political decision making structure on the local level and regional level. So it really looked like it's going to be a total success, really an example of how you can build peace in the world. <coughs> Unfortunately, it didn't go the whole way. Or let's say the re lasting had a backlash into new fighting. And the reason was that one of the parts of the United Nations military forces, or peace enforcement, peacekeeping forces, the United States mission, were still hunting down different kind of warlords. And one of them, General Aidid, uh, made a lot of resistance. <coughs> and as you know, when they tried to hunt him down, 93, you have seen the move Black Hawk down, I guess, where something 20 <coughs> American US soldiers died and something like 300 Somalis were killed. But three of the American soldiers were dragged behind, dead, dragged behind the cars through Mogadishu, and that was sent out the media. And of course, Bill Clinton was nervous on the protest from, from inside the US, and withdraw the American military from Somalia. It was a different time then. It was before 9-11. Uh, After 9-11, it was more acceptable that American soldiers died in, in, in the fight against terrorists, as it was called. But here, at that time, it was different. It was really a domestic uh, turbulence against the U.S. mission in Somalia. And when they withdraw, the United Nations also looked bad in the international eyes. And in order to come forward on a quick fix, as they thought, they started to do what they promised Life, Life and Peace Institute that they would not do, meaning to talk with the warlords. So they gave back the legitimacy to the warlords, and then the process collapsed, unfortunately. But it is a very good example, and it's also a good example in the sense that when you look at the amount of resources that was spent on peace building from below. <laughs> and you're almost astonished. I mean, it's a huge country, Somalia, geographically. And those who have heard this example before, they know how many people who came from life and peace from Sweden to work with peace building from below. How many were there? Do you remember? Two. Two, exactly. Two people. Of course, they had to build peace together with the locals. It was not a mission with hundreds of people from Sweden coming there. But they built up a civil society organization in Somalia who took over the responsibility with some sort of advisory consultancy status with life and peace. And from there on they worked with it. Another very, very important insight <coughs> from this example is that um, they were so successful in the beginning and so visible in the Somali context. So when it went well and ceasefire came and they started to build up the local municipality structures and so on, uh, of course, life and peace became the big heroes in Somalia. I mean, there are many people of the <coughs> generation that still remember life and peace. They still have some sort of good reputation from that time. However, when things go bad, you will be, even if you're not the one who's responsible for it, you will be accused for being part of, of the bad side, that it escalated again. So one of the very important insights from the Somali example is that you cannot be so alone, you cannot be so visible when you act in, in a conflict context, as a civil society play. It's different when you're a top leader, and you're always visible. But here, you should have, have some sort of structure where you involve as many civil society associations and organizations as possible, and divide the burden between you, so that you collectively take the responsibility for what's going on. And, and I think that's, that's a very important insight. Unfortunately, it took some time before 
life and peace realized it itself because they continue in many other contexts in Congo, Eastern Congo and had the same mission and, and it went very well in the beginning but they had the same kind of backlash and were very very hated by many militias in Eastern Congo and attacked by, because of that even if they were not the reason for the escalation of the conflict again or relapse into war and violence but it shows that it's one of the best examples you can have on how far you can come with relatively few resources in staff way as well as money wise by just involving the people uh, again here they are very much linked to the international arena the question is and John Podander would definitely say you should be linked to the United Nations already from the very beginning and, and do it yourself because those players on the outside should contribute to help not to drive the process as the United Nations still could do by deciding to talk with the war or so there are many other examples you could take from the these types of interventions in civil society. I think this is a good one. Any questions on life and peace? Yes. <coughs> 